Baruchem Aboyim, thank you for coming. Uh, the topic today is a uh, current topic, um, especially with uh, what's going on in Europe, and to some extent the United States, not quite as evident. Uh, it's anti-Semitism. And the um, question is why? And um, what's really the origin of it? Um, it's interesting, the word uh, Semite really is, if you're wondering where it, the, where it comes from, is from the word Shame, one of the sons of Noah, whose name was Shame, and anyone descended from him is a Semite. It, the term has become narrowed because really Arabs, a lot of the Arabs are really Semites because Yishmael, Yishmael was the son of Abraham, Abraham, and therefore many of the Arabs are Semites. But the term, term has narrowed to when someone is an anti-Semite, someone has an issue with uh, someone who is Jewish. Now, the question really becomes, do they hate us? Is that really what it's about? So if you are a Jew, does anti-Semitism fall on you? And the interesting answer is no. Because the truth is that if you are born a Jew, and you convert to any of the religions in the world, you are totally accepted, you can be the Pope. No one has anything against you, the fact that you were born Jewish, or if you're just not affiliated. If you decide to live anywhere, and you say you're an atheist or an agnostic, and you have no real beliefs in religion, no one has a problem with you. When does the problem begin? The problem begins when you call yourself a Jew, not even a practicing or a religious Jew, just the term Jew, even the word Israeli. But the truth is the word Israeli still does not give you that bias, because if you're an Arab and you're an Israeli Arab, again, there's no anti-Semitism. No one has a problem with you because you are an Arab who lives in Israel or who is a citizen of Israel. So it's not even being an Israeli. It is specifically being a Jew and acknowledging that fact to people. If you don't acknowledge that fact, the world has no problem. So it's not our noses that they hate. What they really hate is God. And it's interesting, and the place we see this is in the prayers, in the Shemona Esrei, in the fourth blessing of those what we call the requests. It says, the Hebrew term is which translates to mean we tell God to see us, behold us in our affliction and wage our battles. Why? Why are we asking God this? And this verse continues. It says, and redeem us quickly because of your name. The reason why people have a problem with us is because we take on God. And by saying you're a Jew, what you're saying is you're connected to God. So where anti-Semitism really comes from is the fact that we are connected to God. Don't connect to God, no one has a problem with you. Convert to another religion, even though we believe as Jews that a Jew is a Jew. The one thing you have that cannot be taken away from you is the fact that you are a Jew. If you are born a Jew, you will die a Jew, whether you practice or not. It has nothing to do. It's an amazing thing. Not even God Almighty himself. A Jew is a Jew. He can be a good Jew or a bad Jew. But he's a Jew. If your mother is a Jew, you are born as a Jew. End of story. Now, it's also interesting, even though people, we, we call ourselves, or the world calls us, the chosen nation. And many times it's said as a sign of arrogance. But the truth is, even if we're royalty, and we are B'ni B'chor Yisrael, my firstborn Israel, if you look at England and you see the royal family, what, what royalty is really supposed to do is serve the people. In Jewish law, when, a, when we pray, again, the Shemona Esrei, the standing prayer, we bow four times. When a high priest would say the same prayer, he would bow at the beginning and end of every one of the 18 blessings. A king would bow at the first word and stayed bowed throughout the whole prayer until the last word, shalom, peace. The greater the man, the greater the humility. So when we are called the chosen people, what does chosen mean? It means we have a responsibility. 
that we are to be a light upon the nations. It's interesting that the word clergy, or better, better yet, the word clerical, comes from the word clergy. In the old world, people did not read and write. Only clergy. And that's where the word clerical comes from. Except for Jews. Jews, because of the fact that they had to learn the Torah, they did read, they did write. So what God expects of us, again, the non-Jewish world has seven Noahide laws. We have 613. God expects more of us. God expects us to be a light unto the nations. In fact, that's the reason, if you stop and think about it, when the Jews sinned grievously, what did God do? He exiled them, he destroyed the temple, exiled them to the four corners of the earth. It's never happened to any nation. Four corners of the earth. Why? Because you can't be a light unless you're close to something. A light is useless from a distance. We were exiled to the four corners of the earth. And if God wanted us, if we were bad in Israel, why would we be better exiled and spread out throughout the world? The best chance we would have of being better, of, of, of retracing our steps, of becoming better and, and better people serving God better would be to stay in Israel as a unit. Not to be thrown throughout the world amongst the nations who had many times totally immoral, licentious like in, like in Egypt. And the truth of the matter is it's very difficult to keep yourself to a higher standard. And that becomes our obligation to retain that standard, to be to elevate everything around us. It's kind of like a class. If you go to, into a class in school, and a class and the teacher class in, uh, uh, grades by class average. If a person gets a hundred and everybody else gets fifty or below, you're not really liked a whole lot, because they're going to say to you, "You could have got sixty, and you would have had an A, and we would all had." A's or B's or C's, whatever, instead of we all flunk and you get the A. You know, you don't have to be that good. And that's what the nations say. Listen, you know, we understand you want to be religious. Do you have to be that religious? Do you have to bring the level up that high? Why? Just be like us. So there are two ways for a person to move up. One way is to catch up to the person above them. The other way is to bring the person above them down. And this became what the world did. The world tried to bring us down to their level. And on the other hand, it's our obligation to elevate the world. And wherever we've gone, even though, again, Jews have done, that's not like Jews are without, without any faults, but still there's more morality. Family's very important. There are certain traits. We believe that chesed, rachman, mabusha, the word charev, where the Torah was given on the mountain called charev, Mount Sinai, one of the names given which stands for kindness, mercy, and modesty. And these are traits. These are bread. When the Jewish nation began, the fathers of the, of the Jewish nation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, married within the family for a reason. Just like with animals, they bred these traits into their children. And that's the reason why we see in the Torah that Abraham sends his, his servant Eliezer, to a 27-day camel drive to his family to bring back a wife for Yitzchak or Isaac because they wanted to breed these traits into their family. And that's what it is. At the same time, the truth of the matter is anyone can become Jewish. It's not a closed club, even though we don't proselytize. And even if someone wants to become Jewish, we ask them why. Because the truth is we do believe that everyone has a portion in the world to come, Jew and Gentile alike. So when a Gentile comes and says he wants to become a Jew, we try to talk him out of it. Why take on that responsibility? But if he insists and he has a desire to do so, we embrace him. And not only is he treated just like any other Jew, he's not a second-class citizen. In the Torah, there is at least 27 times the Torah says, on top of loving another person, to love the, the ger, the convert, even more, since he has chosen to do so. So it's not a closed club. So where does, it, where does it originate from? So we see in the Torah that Yaakov had, Jacob had a brother, Esau. And when they, the Torah refers to Esau, 
there's two ways they refer to him. Asav and his brother. But the truth is, there were, Ace, uh, Yaakov only had one brother. There were twins. They were born together. There were no other children. So when we say the name Asa, we know it was Jacob, Jacob's brother. Or if we say it's his brother, then we know it's Asa. Why does the Torah mention both? Because the amazing thing is that the nations of the world have tried to destroy us through two avenues. One is by killing us, by, by, by oppressing us. And the other is by opening their arms and loving us. By welcoming them, us in to their families. By intermarriage. And, in fact, that was a tool that was used in the old world by conquering nations. That the governor or whatever would, would bed all the virgins before they got married. So that their traits would be given over into the nation that they conquered. So this is, this is not a new concept. This bedroom politics of sorts. So what, what happens is that we're either hated and people try to kill us, but even worse is what they, when we are welcomed in and treated with respect and adoration. And what you have, Nazi Germany, before the war, the intermarriage rate in Germany was 75%. 75%. I had a neighbor who was a German officer in the First World War who was in the United States during the Second World War. The Germans were very precise. They were sending him his um, pension while he was in the United States during World War II, because right is right. Had he had gone to Germany, they would have put him in a concentration camp, because that's what it is. So the, the Germans tried to, first we intermarried with them, and then they tried to kill us out, both sides. And it's interesting, even the Alter Rebbe, in the time of Napoleon, that the, the Alter Rebbe backed the Tsar, who was a rabid anti-Semite, against Napoleon, who offered Jews equality and freedom. Because what kills out Judaism more than anything else is when, when we're given that freedom, what we do is we leave God. And that's what the great rabbis in Russia were afraid of. So the anti-Semitism is actually, Abraham was told by God, because God told Abraham that I will, I will exile your children to all corners of the earth. And then I'll bring them back. And Abraham says, why will they come back? Once they are accepted among the nations, what's going to bring them back? And God said, because the nations will hate them. And that's what will bring them back. And that's why Netanyahu went to France and told the Jews, you have a country, Israel. And that's the country that we have. And we need to know the greatest gift that we have as Jews is being Jewish. And anti-Semitism, the truth is, and I don't want any Jew hurt, but if the nations hate us, at least they don't take our children. And when they love us, they take our greatest treasures away. And that intermarriage is what destroys our nation. So God help us that Jews don't get hurt. But when someone calls you a dirty Jew, thank him. Because he, what he has done is made a distinction between you and him, much like the country club that says no Jews and no dogs allowed. The rabbi doesn't mind. It doesn't bother him in the least, and he wants to know when the dogs were elevated. We don't belong there in the first place. So the key becomes is we need to know who we are and, and give it honor to that, to that fact of who we are and what we are, and accept that responsibility of being a light unto the nations, and bring the world up not come down to the world, even though everybody wants to be the same. No one wants to be different, not by nature. But we need to have the strength of character to swim against the current and to be a light unto the nations as God expects of us. May God give us strength to do so and may God protect our children. God bless and have a good Shabbos. Thank you for coming.